A very good evening to all of you. Um, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this Global Lawyers Colloquium hosted by Jindal Global Law School of OP Jindal Global University. First of all, I would like to welcome all our distinguished lawyers and leaders uh, of various law firms uh, from India and the United States and UK to join us here on this Global Lawyers Colloquium. I also hope that all the viewers who are watching this program are fine and safe and healthy uh, during this extraordinary crisis uh, posed to us by the global pandemic COVID-19. Today we are here for this webinar on global lawyering and the corporate legal profession in a post-corona world. As we stand at this devastating number of over 3.6 million cases of coronavirus across the world, with over 250,000 plus deaths, it's only fair to say that 2020 has presented with us with one of the largest crises of our times. This unprecedented crisis calls for urgent attention from our healthcare systems, also our legal system. We face a surge with different types of legal issues, ranging from financial frauds to healthcare legal battles to unfortunate cases of domestic violence. Law firms see a movement in commercial disputes and restructuring and insolvency cases. The global justice system and law firms across the world have the responsibility to mitigate these legal issues and maintain order within this chaos that could arise as a byproduct of COVID-19. The challenge law firms face today is how do they strike a sensitive balance between these very responsibility towards the rising demands of justice while working within the current limitations as social distancing norms become the new normal. Can the current crisis be an opportunity to reinvent ourselves and re-innovate at the very fundamentals of law firms corporate governance and commercial dispute resolution mechanism. With the remote courtrooms becoming more common, is it indeed time to embrace technology to ensure greater access to legal justice, not just in relation to litigation, but also for corporate and transactional work? Is the law firm's present way of functioning going to be the future? These are some of the issues that we intend to discuss today as we have a very distinguished set of lawyers from around the world. Let me begin by introducing Mr. Nishit Desai, who's a founder of the law firm Nishit Desai Associates. It's a research and strategy-driven international law firm. Nishit himself is a renowned international tax law, corporate law, IP lawyer, researcher, publishing author, and also an academic. He specializes in the financial services sector and assisted a number of governments, including the government of Mauritius and the government of India, in launching their individual offshore financial centers. He played a seminal role in structuring several private equity funds in addition to structuring several domestic venture capital funds. My favorite, Nishit, I also created something known as the Imaginarium, which is known as Ali Gunjan, a state-of-the-art facility that stands as an ode to blue sky thinking. Welcome to the Global Lawyers Colloquium. Uh, I have great pleasure in welcoming Mr. Haigreep Ketan. Haigreep Ketan is a senior partner at Ketan & Company and heads the firm's corporate M&A and private equity practice. He was recently honored as a deal maker of the year in 2019 by Asian Legal Business India Law Awards and comes with a stellar recommendation by most publications. He's consistently ranked as India's top corporate M&A and private equity lawyer. He also sits as a member of the board of directors of various public list companies, including Torrent Pharmaceuticals, Mahindra & Mahindra, Seat Limited, JSW Limited, and Aditya Billa Sun Life Insurance Company. Well, welcome to this webinar. Mr. Nandan Nelevigi. Nandan is a partner and regional section head of Whiten Case, New York. Nandan has completed his uh, uh, law degree from the National Law School, Bangalore, and then also from, uh, did his LLM from Harvard Law School. He specializes in the development and financing of energy and infrastructure projects. He represents sponsors, banks, export credit agencies, and underwriters in the development and financing of conventional and renewable energy products, such as some of the largest natural gas plants, wind energy, and solar farms and ethanol plants. He's also an adjunct lecturer at Columbia Law School and teaches a seminar course on doing cross-border transactions in India. I also want to mention that he's a distinguished member of the International Board of Advisors of Jindal Global Law School. Welcome, Nandan. I have great pleasure in welcoming Mr. Chris Parsons. Chris Parsons is the partner and chairman of the India practice of Herbert Smith Freehills. He also helps guide the firm's social initiatives in India, spends most of his time in India, a country which has made become a second home. Chris is the guiding force behind the global Indian practice of the firm. Having spent over 30 years at the firm, he has over 10 years experience of adding value to both Indian groups and to global businesses looking to invest in India. He has a deep understanding of India and can bring this to bear for the benefit of his clients. Chris sits on the board of the UK India Business Council, the primary body that promotes business relations between the UK and India. Mr. Cyril Stroff 
It's a pleasure to welcome you here. Mr. Shroff is the managing partner of Cyril Amachan Mangaldas with nearly 40 years of experience in a range of areas, including corporate and securities law, disputes, resolution, banking, bankruptcy, infrastructure, private clients, financial regulatory matters, and other areas of law. He is one of the most distinguished lawyers of India. He was also a member of the SEBI constituted Uday Kota Committee on Corporate Governance and the SEBI Committee on Insider Training. He is also a member of First Apex Advisory Committee of the IMC International ADR Center, Task Force Member of Society of Insolvency Practice of India. He is also a member of the Advisory Board of the Center for Study of the Legal Profession established with Harvard Law School and also a member of the Advisory Board of the National Institute of Securities Market and I am Trichy. Welcome to this webinar, uh, Cyril. All right, now that the introductions are done, uh, I want to begin by having an open question uh, to uh, the panelists here. Let me start with uh, Cyril. And um, Cyril, tell us about where we are today. I think this pandemic has created a tectonic shift in the way we do business and the way firms are uh, as well. So from where you are, I would like one of you to briefly reflect about the state of affairs that we are in. Thank you, Raj, and thank you for uh, organizing this and uh, and the generous uh, introduction. So, uh, as we look back on the history of uh, uh, of of the profession and also of humanity over the last, let's say, over the last uh, hundred years, we had the Great Depression. What we're currently going through has been characterized as the Great Lockdown. But I think there is one point that is being missed as well, which is that it is also the great reboot. So it is an opportunity really for uh, all leaders in the world, professions, businesses, academics, of others to think about themselves and think about their role in society in a very fundamental way. So uh, the, the great financial crisis was described by a Columbia professor using a med medical uh, sort of metaphor as a heart attack. On the, the, it was like a heart attack, but what has been what is being described by the same academic or where we are just now is it's a total body seizure. That's the difference in the scale between all previous crises and this crisis that we are going through. But also it is equally true that humanity is far more equipped to sort of deal with uh, these issues. Science has advanced, technology has advanced. Just look at this webinar itself. with over a thousand people and how we are uh, we have all been working from home for the last uh, two months is an indication really of while the nature of the crisis is much bigger, our ability to deal with it is also significantly evolved. The, when we are going to come out of this on the other end of this, I think the world is going to be fundamentally different. I think we have been spoiled in the past by both the global financial crisis as well as things like SARS or MERS, because what happened was that whilst it was quite a severe event and it caused a lot of disruption, what human memory remembers it as we came back from it uh, roaring back into more prosperity and as if nothing had happened. So as we look back even to the SARS incident, we feel that it was just a blip and it went away. So I think we've been spoiled by that. And my own personal view is that this one is very different. This one is very different because it's global. This one is very different because of the norms in relation to social distancing uh, are going to have a much deeper impact on how businesses actually operate. Uh, the global nature of this crisis is fundamentally different from what were otherwise fundamentally local crises. Even in the great financial crisis, yes, it affected the, the, the financial system, but it didn't affect humanity at a very personal level. You were not afraid to go, even in the midst of the crisis, you were not afraid to go to a restaurant or, or to a theater or to go to office. Now that is fundamentally very different as well. So uh, I think humanity has discovered a lot of new things about itself. The policy environment is also discovering a lot of new initiatives and new uh, new solutions as well. And fundamentally, I think what has happened is that at a very broad level, I think the state has become extremely powerful. Uh, if there is one theme that comes out of this in the last two months and, and everything that is happening country after country is that the state has become all powerful. The individual, whether it's the human being or an individual organization, has in the, in the hierarchy been significantly subordinated uh, in terms of the broader public good as well. And that is going to drive a lot of policy making as well. The policy meter has shifted significantly to the left. It was somewhere in the center, depending on which country you were. But now almost globally, 
the policy meter has uh, the policy direction and the policy sort of compass has moved significantly to the left and it's going to affect policy making is going to affect the attitude of business is going to affect the judiciary we're seeing that in in, in india already on on matters of public policy whether it's on firing employees or on enforcing loans against uh, pledges of uh, promoter share all of these put together has resulted in a fundamental reset of the mentality now it could be a temporary thing because we're still in the midst of it but my own thesis is that this has changed in a very dramatic way for the good and i think it's for the better because a reboot i think is always a time to reflect and reinvent oneself and humanity has always come out it has always pulled a rabbit out of its hat uh, at the end of it and i think we will do that again so that's my initial thoughts uh, just from a legal profession point of view i think uh, you know we, thank you sir i believe thank that so the much. legal profession will do better than the thank economy you. I, yeah go ahead thank you so much sir for that or right, i want to quickly move to nandan uh, nandan uh, from where you are sitting uh, we get to hear that uh, new york has pretty much become the epicenter of uh, this crisis and so it will be very useful for us to hear uh, what the situation with regard to the firms are in new york how vital case as a firm is responding to it can you give us some preliminary thoughts uh, good morning good afternoon and good evening to everybody attending this webinar yes uh, as you mentioned uh, i i am in new york unfortunately has become the epicenter of the current pandemic uh, it's a place that uh, we are used to being unfortunately uh, new york was arguably the epicenter of the global financial crisis arguably ep epicenter of the uh, the technology crisis that we experienced during the dot-com burst, and certainly the epicenter of the national security crisis we faced uh, during 9-11. Um, the way we are right now in New York is, in my mind, is primarily a time of reflection. Uh, it's a reflection about the crises that we've been going through one after the other with frequency. Um, I think it's time to think about new crises that we will face. It's time to think about what actually went wrong before the crisis, what helped us prepare for this crisis, and how we move forward from this crisis. I think in terms of our own law firm, and as far as I can tell other law firms who are currently dealing with this crisis, the ones who are best able to deal with the current crisis are those who were prepared uh, for these kinds of crises. Obviously, we are dealing with a situation that nobody expected, but I think people have been expecting uh, some sort of crisis or the other based on the previous experience. Now, in terms of how we are dealing with the current situation, the irony of this is how much our people miss the physical work environment. Uh, the irony of the situation is we really miss the human connection, the teamwork, that the physical workspace uh, brought to all of us. Uh, although we benefit so much from technology, we took the technology for granted, but we also took the physical workspace for granted. I think the, the, the challenge for all of us now is to harness the emotional energy of all the people, even though we're not able to communicate in close proximity. And I think we are seeing the best come out of the people right now. And that is really driving us forward. And we are at a point where we are performing at, at our highest levels, both individually and as, a, as, as, and as an organization. Contrary to our expectation that this crisis was going to set us back, we're actually performing at a very high level at this point of time. That's it for me, Raj. Thank you. Uh, a vision for the firm to be virtual, you know, one of the earliest uh, adopters of a virtual firm experience. So, uh, can you please reflect about where, from where you are, how do you see this uh, change that's going to impact the world of law firms? Sorry, yes, that for? That's, what, that's what Nishit. I said Nishit. Raj, we lost you. What did you ask? Nishit, I was asking that from where oh, you are, me. thank you. Wanted, okay, I lost uh, you for a while. Thank you, you so much. Uh, uh, Siri, like to be a virtual firm. Yeah, uh, I think thank you so much. Uh, I think Siri and Nandan both made excellent points, and if I may just add. Uh, to those, uh, you know, statements, uh, uh, and you talked about virtual firm. What had happened uh, was that, uh, fortunately, you know, when I founded the firm in 1990, it was just the era of new age for technology infrastructure getting into place. And uh, I got to read Charles Handy and uh, some of the other authors 
who actually advised that uh, you know going forward if you are a new startup i think technology is the way to go so from day one the vision was clear uh, on going for virtual firms and that virtual firms are basically they said it would be based on the trust and so it's a trust based organ you can't see people you can't have physical control you cannot have all those kind of things but trust is not blind and then we combine with Martha Gandhi's trusteeship model and created the firm. So in many ways, uh, the fundamentals of technology were uh, already in. They got accelerated sometime in 2000 when the dot-com boom happened. And um, we have also seen dot-com boom and bust both and see that at times, you know, same situation. If you look at the in Silicon Valley, you know, this is a global basis, but the uh, 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 is on the global basis, it was on the California based, let us put it in that way. So we have seen complete, like it was a ghost town, okay? And I saw a presentation by Don Valentine, uh, you know, of China Perkins, and he showed number of newspaper clippings going back to 50s and 60s that Silicon Valley is dead. That, and then, you know, again, he showed after five years, again, the same thing, again, the same thing, you know, world said it's dead, dead, and again, it revived. So I learned one thing, that whenever we see a situation like pandemic or any other kind of uh, a situation, there is always a hope to get back. And today you can see what's happening. So number one, the technology culture was already embedded and we have invested a lot more in technology than many other infrastructure from the beginning. And that has really helped us today when people work from home, what is the biggest anxiety you have? Would somebody steal client information or you know what would they do how do you manage that security when you cannot see them that is the biggest security so we have uh, installed military grade security systems and stuff like that so wherever people work from we don't have to worry too much yes we are concerned but not unduly worried about where people are working from that is one thing number two we are saying this is an opportunity to innovate uh, reinvent yourself and uh, you know reorganize yourself as well we never realized what was the power of technology even though we all had technology half the time 90 percent of features we never use but suddenly this is compelling you to find out what all you can do with technology and therefore that is a, a great enabler both for internal purposes and for external purposes as you mentioned that we are research-based law firm and we have every continuing education and all those kind of whole firm gets together every morning and does it now we extended that to all the clients and now we are extended to all the law firms professional firms and we train them every day with three sessions so we have created something called client continuing education program but it's not just for clients we see hundreds of uh, you know professional thing on a daily basis because it is a time to collaborate it is not just compete and you know be in your own territory territorial mindset has to go so we think that it is a responsibility not only to uh, train our people but also to train other law firms other people schools and all those kind of things because what else can you do number two that by the time you uh, create those competencies and uh, capacities Thank you. Uh, within yourself and within the clients, you should be able to render your services also too. So, so business of law is also very important. So you have to look at from both sides. And uh, you know we are doing a lot of things around. I don't want to bore you with that. But virtual firm we declared, I just had one more point that uh, day one we decided that we'll go virtual. Well, we'll but what we did was to clarify to that virtual in the coming times is 80-20 model. Okay. Sure. Thank, thank you, Nishit, for that. Um, let me. Uh, I can't thank you so you. much. We'll come back to that. Um, let me take uh, take this to Chris. Um, Chris, uh, Chris, can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, Chris, my question is that. Can you hear me? What we hear from our friends in New York I, and I can, even Raj. in India is that this is an extraordinary moment of crisis. Yet the law firms somehow are able to respond to this crisis better. So uh, I would like you to briefly reflect about a uh, global law firm such as Herbert Smith Freels. How is it positioning itself to deal with it? Sure. Look, thanks, Raj. And, and also, um, thank you to you for your uh, lead. Um, so look, I want to start, if I may, Raj, with a, um, with a disclaimer. And my disclaimer is this, that um, as you know, Raj, over the course of my career, sadly, um, I've suffered periodically from stress, anxiety, depression, and self-medicated with, with alcohol 
such that I um, developed a um, alcohol use disorder, more commonly known as alcoholism. And um, and sadly, um, as I mentioned to you, I, I tried to get out of this um, seminar that you kindly put on because I'm not feeling great. Um, and then on further reflection, I thought maybe <laughs> actually this is just the time that I ought to be talking out because I know that a lot of people around the world will be feeling anxious and stressed and possibly suffering from worse mental health issues as a result of the lockdown. And whilst there are, I know because I've spoken to lots of people, many people who are dealing with it really effectively are actually enjoying the idea of working from home, uh, uh, avoiding the daily commute, etc. cetera. Um, there are equally plenty of people who I know are struggling and are finding it difficult. And Nandan talked about the need for connection. And there's no question in my mind that human beings need to connect in a very real way in order to feel uh, rewarded, fulfilled, and complete. And this is a very difficult time in order to meet that basic human need. And so one of the things that I think a lot of, of the most successful law firms are doing are um, both reaching out to the people that work with them compassionately and also reaching out to clients compassionately and recognizing that whilst some people will be in a good place, other people will be in a less good place. It's been interesting that we've run globally around the world a whole host of webinars, seminars, etc. on this crisis, whether it's around dealing with employees, whether it's dealing with government packages of support, whether it's dealing with contractual analysis. But the one most important seminar that we've run has been on mental well-being. And clients, um, we had the biggest audience and we had the best feedback. So the clients wanted to understand that we as a law firm cared about the things that were affecting them as human beings. And I think in the same way that we need to reach out to our clients, we need to reach out to our staff in the same way. We need to over communicate at this time. We need to be as open and honest as possible about the effects on our business. We need as partners to be taking some pain in all of this and not passing pain on to the rest of the organization. So I think this is a time to be incredibly compassionate. And I'll, and I'll finish this particular part, if I may, Raj, with, 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 with two observations. One is, um, and particularly for the students that may be listening to this, because those of us on, on this call will be uh, a, a little older than, than the students who, who will be listening, or most of the students who will be listening. And the two comparators that, that, um, that spring to mind, one um, Cyril and others have referred to, and that is the um, 2008 financial crisis. Markets dropped further and quicker during that time, but I do know that many organizations think the recession will be longer term following this crisis. Uh, so that needs to play out. The second comparator that people have not mentioned and I haven't read a lot about is the AIDS and HIV crisis. Now that killed 32 million people. And so far, this crisis has killed 250,000 people. So I just, I do not want for one second to downplay this crisis, but I just think we need to remember that there have been other very, very significant things in our lifetime, which are now a little bit in the in 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 the memory and not so much the forward memory maybe a little bit like the distant memory so my sense for what it's worth is that if things um if the lockdown ends sooner rather than later and of course we need to see what that looks like in practice human beings have remarkably short memories and we could be sitting here in 12 months time talking about life being not wholly different from the life that it was before. But I do also take Cyril's point around a reboot. I think it is a wonderful opportunity to reflect on what it is to be a human being, what it is to, what's important to us, um, what's meaningful to us, um, and, 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 and for us to try and play that out in our day-to-day -day lives, whether with our firms and our teams uh, or with our clients. So I'll, I'll leave it there if I may, Raj. Thank you so much, um, Chris, for that. I think it's also your own um, story and reflection is an example of uh, resilience and reimagination. And I do believe that sometimes when we are facing a crisis, we tend to overemphasize the crisis and not necessarily being conscious of uh, the resilience inherently in human beings. 
Uh, all right, let me quickly move to high green. I mean, from where you stand, uh, you know, when you look at Qatar, it has a large India-wide presence with the lawyers and clients spread across the country and around the world. How are you dealing with this situation? So thank you, Raj. Uh, you know, I'd say that, uh, you know, this is uh, unprecedented where, uh, you know, notwithstanding where you are, who you are, the rich or the poor, uh, this crisis is affecting you. And, uh, you know, this is really a great opportunity, apart from, of course, uh, you know, dealing with this crisis to learn. And the way really I'm dealing with this in the firm is uh, look at the opportunity to learn. So the learning can be on new laws, uh, the validity of the new laws. So laws are changing and coming on a daily basis. So whether it's constitutional issues, cyber issues, uh, extraterritorial issues, I think uh, in this profession, uh, we couldn't have had an opportunity to learn more. Uh, while I say that, uh, also learn about industry and business, uh, how every business and industry is tackling this differently. The healthcare industry is doing something, the auto industry is doing something else, and how it applies to us. The biggest learning is uh, learning about our lives and how we live our life. And, uh, you know, whether it is in small things or larger things, uh, values of life, and uh, it touches all of us. And I think that is a huge aspect. Uh, uh, we are doing in the firm that look are we taking lessons uh, out of this uh, crisis the second part is really contributing to society so while we are all so, sort of concerned about our own individual self about our firms our practices our business uh, are we are we taking this opportunity to do some pro bono work to contribute to society uh, help the needy and that's another thing uh, i'd really like to see the firm doing and contributing in whichever manner and i think lastly uh, working with the government on rulemaking. So again, never have we had this opportunity uh, where worldwide governments are acting and uh, different policies, uh, different rules. And this is such a great opportunity for lawyers uh, to participate with government on rulemaking. So I think it's a huge, huge learning exercise uh, for life generally and for the profession. All right. Thank you so much, Haigri, for that. Uh, well, let me circle back to Cyril. Uh, Cyril, you know, one of the things that we hear from uh, all of you is that this crisis will indeed pass and there is a lot of resilience in individuals and institutions to respond to it. But our experience of looking at past crises is that, that those crises didn't, did not lead to fundamental reimagination of the law firm culture or for that matter, institutional structures to design the firm itself. Do you think that the COVID-19 situation has the potential to you know, impact law firms and the corporate legal profession, unlike the previous crisis, including the economic crisis that the world has faced. Sure. So, uh, firstly, I believe that uh, on many screens, though not all screens, my image is upside down. Now, I've always been known to have a different point of view, but uh, I think your, uh, your back end kind of took that a little literally. So, I have two pieces of advice. Either shut your eyes and just listen to me or turn yourself upside down and then you might be able to hear me. So with that being said, uh, just to um, sort of answer your question, uh, firstly, whether this will fundamentally result in a change of the law firm model, I think to an extent, yes, but not, I think it's being a bit overstated at the moment, but certain things are definitely going to change. A couple of things which will change is I think the view of firms in relation to real estate i think will change it doesn't mean that there will be no offices anymore uh, i think there will be offices and i think there will be nice offices because fundamentally human beings and clients as well as internally in teams the need for social connect will still be there and teams need that psychological reinforcement a point which chris also made so i think while offices will be there i believe for a long period of time at least a part of the workforce will uh, uh, will be working from home and i think it will kind of create a new type of labor economy where you could have a gig workforce where you could kind of bring them in on a project basis what's called a hollywood model where you kind of get a team together from movie to movie similarly you could get a part of your team uh, together on uh, from a from a sort of project by project basis while retaining the core i think that will change i think that the use of technology will change in a very big way as well and by technology, I don't mean just by having um, laptops, smartphones, and using Office 65 or video conferencing. That's kind of par for the course. That's not even technology anymore. 
but i think the use of uh, artificial intelligence or the use of uh, machine learning and, and different forms of technology in order to actually deliver a product uh, i think there will be an impact not only on corporate lawyering but i think there will be a big impact on this even in dispute resolution whether it's online courts or whether it is uh, sort of alternative dispute resolution i think you're going to see a very big change in in terms of uh, in terms of that which professor richard suskin has kind of he has put out that thesis that is our courts a place or our courts a service so i guess the whole debate about whether access to justice is a service or it is a place where you go to in order to find justice as if it was a temple and you see a bit of that playing out uh, uh, playing out as well uh, i think the nature of uh, the skill sets of a lawyer will change as well in a recent uh, short video i had done uh, for bar and bench i had also mentioned a, 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 a point about one of the most important skills that will be needed is the skill of learnability uh, so a point which both nishit bhai made hygri made as well that all of us are having to uh, to learn new skills and they're not just in terms of particular uh, branches of law or the new notification that came out yesterday morning but just in terms of how to approach a problem i mean i personally until this uh, until this whole episode i was technologically challenged now i become pretty good at it and i learned all these skills in the last two months so i think that's a lesson also for uh, a lot of young um, a lot of young lawyers as well of keeping an open mind and not looking at your career necessarily in terms of branches of the law in terms of specialization of subjects but a whole new set of skills not only in terms of legal skills but also human skills bringing emotional intelligence to uh, to 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 your work product for example uh, you know one of the things that's going to happen with more social distancing and technology is the human element is going to be at a discount so the hub the workplace and also the work product will have to be significantly humanized as well this is a big theme that we are focusing on as well so i think corporate lawyering as well as dispute lawyering uh, lawyering is going to change forever but it's not I... going to change so fundamentally that it is unrecognizable i think we will save some of the best pieces of the past and we will add a lot of new parts to it as well so i'll i'll stop here but if there are any further follow on questions on this thank you so much sir for that uh, i will come back so nandan uh, i want to take uh, one uh, you see you know the bmw mercedes benz type organizations which have endured um, and achieved excellence in what they are doing uh, many of the manufacturing companies are ready to move into responding to the needs i heard them speaking about the fact that some of them have moved into you know manufacturing let's say ventilators uh, you know the ability to completely transform themselves Uh, when you are at that type of sectors is much more stronger so i would like you to reflect a bit about service sectors such as law firm to what extent they are let's say you know positioned to adapt themselves so fundamentally to the crisis and do other things things they may not have done before the new things that they would have to do because of the crisis itself is that even possible for a law firm to do because one of the things why law firms are respected and let's say achieve excellence in what they're doing is they are specialized in doing that and doing it for a very long time yeah raj um you know we all talk about innovation radical transformation but the strength of law firms is the steadiness and the stability that law firms provide not only for their lawyers who work with the law firms but also for the clients we've been around for more than 100 years as have been a number of other law firms around the world right and we were around when the last influenza crisis the plague way back in 1918 was around i do not i do not think that we radically transformed ourselves because of that pandemic um i think that people who are trying to innovate now in the middle of the crisis Uh, are probably too late to the game of innovation. Uh, you can't innovate overnight. Similarly, you can't innovate in through a crisis. I think again, the point uh, I was making earlier is that you need to be prepared to deal with the crisis. So, for example, th- there is no question this is a social and economic seismic event, and uh, disruption has been caused to a lot of our clients in a variety of industries. But the question is, you know. can we start addressing the disruption by trying to innovate now no you know we for example the disruption caused to the transportation industry the hospitality and leisure industry 
the disruption caused to the energy sector. We cannot wake up one day and say, I'm going to serve the needs of the transportation industry. You're talking about BMW and Mercedes, um, the toll roads, the airport operators, the airline industry. The law firms who are able to meet the needs of those clients and those industries are those who already had the existing infrastructure, existing teams to deal with the needs of those industries. You know, every conceivable issue has come up with respect to those industries. And so taking the example of White and Case with 2,400 lawyers around the world, we, are we have organized ourselves into sector specific teams. So we have an energy sector, we have a transportation sector, um, we have a sector that focuses on pharmaceutical industry and the life sciences industry, and we have a financial restructuring and bankruptcy team. The fact that we had these teams existing before has basically prepared us to deal with the kinds of issues that are being thrown up in the middle of this crisis. Are we simply going to remain the way we were? No, I'm sure we will adopt to the adapt to the circumstances. I'm sure we'll bring about a number of changes, but I do not think that this is necessarily going to cause a radical shift or transformation in the way we serve the needs of our clients. Thank you, Nandan. Thank you very much for that. And that's, that creates a lot of balance and perspective. Let me move to Nishit Desai. Uh, Nishit, uh, this question, uh, you know, what Nandan said, I want to take it uh, back to you, which is that um, are those firms and organizations which have undertaken innovation some time ago are better suited to deal with this crisis? And in a way, the question is, is artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, and other types of technological innovation, is it going to be embraced more and more by law firms? And is this going to become the new normal? And in that new normal, there will only be some people who are going to be better situated because they have undertaken innovation much earlier. Uh, in a way, yes. Uh, th there are two types of situations. One who are dealing with traditional uh, uh, practice, I think there also there is an opportunity to innovate and I'll talk separately about it. But uh, I can only share my experience very humbly. And right from the beginning, the model that we had pursued was what is called anticipate, prepare, and deliver. So we always look, so we spend 40% of time in research and academics and innovation. But the way in which you look at, look at next three, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, uh, and look to what are the new things that are going to happen based on the premise that future may be uncertain, but is not unthinkable. And in the process, we we'll believe that every new technology, every new business model, every new social, political, economic development is uh, going to bring new set of its own regulatory issues, tax issues and stuff like that. So we take, we do trend assessment and forecasting going forward 20, 30 years from now and try to analyze what are the issues that are likely to come. How are we going to address them in the future? So when the time comes, then we are somewhat ready to meet those challenges. It's a very different model in many ways, uh, but that has really also helped us. And I believe more and more firms will be doing the same thing. We are not unique in that space. But the thing is that today, whether it is 3D printing or designer babies, or whether it is IoT, or whether it's drones, all those things we have studied five, seven years ago, and tried to see all the things. Also, we have ingrained uh, non-lawyers, turning them into lawyers, engineers, scientists, and other people into the firm. That has really helped us. So the way in which you ask a question with our model, which is more and more law firms will incorporate non-legal talent into the only thing that we try to make sure that when they just think like non-lawyer, they should not forget that law, our, we are in the profession of law, not in the business of law. And therefore the professional ethics and some of those things, we'll have to culturally also ingrain into the whole model. So as uh, I don't want to go too far into this, but it would be little, for example, today it is becoming easier. Uh, yesterday we had a lot of discussion on the public platform on 5G, okay? It's a great revolution that's going to come, but there are side effects with the radiation, privacy issues. How are you going to meet those challenges? That is what is our study currently going on. So I'm just giving an example. I don't want to boast and talk about it, but I'm saying that we will have to continuously reinvent ourselves every three years. Because I believe that you. work, three months makes a year and three years is a thousand days, you know. So I think we will have to continuously reinvent the practice areas, the model of organization, the way in which we communicate, communicate, we deal with our people and look to the society. And I just, if you don't mind, I'll spend only 30 seconds. Professor Yunus taught me one principle, 
then if you want to help society don't have to look too far whatever skill set you have try to sit down and see can my same skill set be helpful so if you're practicing all the mergers and acquisitions now we are working on how can we have uh, mergers and acquisition not for profit sector we are you the same skill set you don't have to go too far sector you know and everybody can do it i'm just uh, uh, that's how uh, you know Danone, for example, they uh, milk and they created yogurt and stuff like that for the children in Bangladesh. There are many examples of that. So we, if you want to do something, there is always a possibility, and I'm very positive that all of us, you know, sitting together here, would be thinking of doing either the same thing new way or new things new way. Well, thank you so much, Nishit, for that. Um, I entirely agree with you that. Uh, the question of innovation is also connected to how democratized the innovation process is and how firms can take it to a not-for-profit sector as well. Uh, let me go back to Chris. Uh, Chris, I, I know that you are deeply uh, connected to the uh, values that a firm uh, you know, creates for its own staff and indeed the wider impact in society. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the Forbes magazine and which, which essentially talked about how the COVID crisis has the opportunity to evolve the future law firm. And the author, uh, in some ways, closing said, and I quote, the industry, and in this case, the legal industry, has an opportunity to refashion its culture and to ameliorate its horrific suicide, mental health, alcoholism, substance abuse, and divorce rates, each among the highest of any occupation, unquote. And then he concludes, is this a utopian mirage that this crisis can help us solve. And then of course he ends with an optimistic note. I would like you to briefly articulate and reflect about this challenge, whether such crisis can also help us reimagine the culture within our workplace. Uh, look, thank you Raj, and, and, um, and thank you in particular for asking me that, uh, that very important question. Look, the, the answer I would love to give you is that that th th this will be a catalyst that results in, in uh, law firms looking at the position of the people that work in it differently. And there's no question in my mind that there are some real challenges facing us. And indeed, you know, there's still, you know, it's, it's, it's only been a very recent phenomena in the UK that people have, have, have um, been willing to talk about the issue of the pressures of working in the profession and what that does to people. And if, 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 this brings that issue towards the top of the agenda, I think that would be a wonderful thing. And people, you know, they, they talk about taking brilliant students out of, of Jindal and NLS and NLU Delhi and, and Sydney and Melbourne and Yale and Oxford and Cambridge, uh, uh, etc. And then bringing them into an organization where we work them uh, round the clock and wonder one, why they're not very happy, two, why they're not very effective, and three, why they choose to leave the profession. And I think that if we can uh, achieve the sort of environment in which those pressures are understood, and as a result, changes are made to the way in which we work, could easily result in us being just as effective, just as productive, but with people just operating at a different level and in a different way. Um, shortly before I started struggling with this last bout of depression, I had sent um, an email to each of our offices in New York, uh, Dubai, Riyadh, uh, Germany, Milan and Madrid, offering to give them a talk on mental well-being because I know it's an issue for all of our offices. And within four hours, every single one of those offices bar one had said, yes, please, Chris, we would really like you to talk on this topic at this time, because this is important to us and this is important to our clients. I read a, a very um, important piece, two pieces of research I'll just mention very briefly to you. Number one, the this is a piece of research focused on um, the US and Europe. And what it said was that 46% of all disability in the workplace, in the corporate workplace, was down to mental health issues. You know, if we could eradicate just half of that, 
how wonderful would that be at a, both a personal level and an economic level? And I'm afraid that the, the research indicates that the position in India is even worse than that. So I've read um, a very uh, significant um, detailed piece of research that indicated that any one time, 46% of corporate India, so that's including law firms and corporations, et cetera, individuals are suffering from some unhelpful form of mental ill health. So I hope and pray that this crisis will take not only the question of mental well-being of people within law firms, but also for our clients right to the top of our agendas. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chris, uh, for that. And I deeply appreciate your candid reflections on that. Uh, you know, we are also getting hundreds of questions from our viewers, and I invite them to keep doing that. We are collecting it, compiling it, and we'll come back to it shortly. But those of you who are sending in the questions, please do so. And we will indeed try to answer as many questions as possible shortly. Hygreev, I want to quickly move to you. Um, Hygreev, you know, right now we have obviously the lockdown situation in, in India and of course in Mumbai and Delhi and other places. Uh, while there are huge issues that, that are being sought after from commercial lawyer standpoint, uh, force majeure is one issue but there are also many other issues that firms are expected to deal with. How has been your experience of adopting work from home and work of lawyers not actually physically there? To what extent team-based coordination is even possible? Can you share us a bit of some uh, practices that uh, you're experiencing within your firm? Uh, so very good question, Raj. And uh, you know, I'd say that you know, this has uh, been both positive and negative, I'll, I'll put it, you know, so I'll start with some of the uh, negatives, which is obvious, you know, that we are not uh, meeting at workplace, we are not all together, and, uh, you know, we, we are all working remotely from home. But let's look at the positives, you know, what this is given uh, is all of us time to connect, uh, connect with ourselves and connect with our clients. So technologically, you know, we adopted in our firm, uh, Microsoft Teams uh, about a year ago. And I remember when our technology team told us that, look, if you're speaking internally to anybody or communicating, use Microsoft Teams. And there's a lot of reluctance in all of us actually using it and seeing what the use is. And as soon as this lockdown happened, I think every member of the firm more than uh, a thousand people started using Microsoft Teams and connecting with each one on a daily basis. So we are online all the time. We are seeing each other's faces. Uh, it's like really sitting in front of each other uh, for an internal meeting. So what it has done positively is given us more time to connect with each other, more time to communicate, organizing meetings, uh, nobody is unavailable. Everybody is available for meetings. There's no scheduling problem at all uh, in getting together. Uh, getting research and uh, getting inputs. Uh, look at how easy and the power of technology and sharing has shown. So you just post a query that, look, I'm dealing with this issue on force majeure for this client. Does anybody have any views? And you get 700 lawyers contributing and learning. Uh, on the same very issue. So it's been a hugely positive experience. Same thing with clients. Uh, the ability to connect with clients, the ability to engage, uh, to ability to understand their issues uh, has been extremely positive. So it's taught us a new way of uh, connecting. It's taught us a new way of, and it's saving a lot of time. So I'd say all of the positives. And of course, there are concerns around, uh, you know, data security and privacy, and we have to learn and deal with those. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hagrid, for that. All right, I probably will have to move it to questions uh, because, as I said, we have over 200 questions and I'm going to take a few of them. Um, there is a specific question to both Cyril and Nishit from um, a graduate of Jindal, but he used to work at, uh, uh, in fact, at CAM, uh, Suprothik Das. And Suprothik is asking a very interesting question, which might be very relevant for others as well. He's saying that, do you think law firms in India can potentially set up a pandemic response dispute resolution practice area? Perhaps an area will comprise teams from M&A, structuring, litigation, pharma, tech, and business uh, coming together 
and in some ways a, a crisis management practice with other uh, many other lawyers coming together is that a real possibility in the future Cyril and Nishit Cyril to begin with uh, I think we already have uh, we've internally in the firm we've created a COVID uh, sort of practice group which draws from uh, disputes, insolvency, employment, and sort of multi it's more like a platform. And it is, uh, it's still internal. So I think if the question was, can you also have it externally? Uh, I don't see any reason why not, but obviously it's, it was much easier to get going internally as well. So we are already doing that. And I think it's multidisciplinary. Uh, it allows uh, some sort of a consistency of advice. So, you know, in, just to take the force major example, you can't have five different views going out from the firm, depending on who you ask. There has to be a broad consistency in terms of where the firm comes out on some important positions like this. Or, for instance, can you, uh, if you're asked about can you uh, can you fire people, and how are you interpreting the MHA notification? There has to be some uniformity in terms of the approach. On the uh, on the disputes practice, I think there is a whole tsunami of litigation on the other <laughs> side of this, partly force majeure, uh, and and but there will be all sorts of contractual disputes. And I think there is going to be an issue also of how is that uh, how is that litigation going to be financed? So there is, I think, a case for litigation finance there as well, because uh, there is there are going to be genuine causes of action, but no money to fund them. And I think there is a big scope there for litigation finance, which has always been kind of on the fringes in India, but not yet mainstream. And I think it will become mainstream now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Nishit, the same question to you as well. Uh, it is the same thing which I think Syria has said we are all doing. The uh, other thing that we are doing is we have taken segmented approach. So how would COVID affect different segments, whether it's contractual, whether it's cross-border, whether it is in a particular industry to industry and segments and like that. And uh, what we do is to do all these studies and then first discuss internally. But at the end of the day, we are also talking to public in our continuing education program, which we have now made public. So we are able to go to people and also tell them these are the issues. So everybody doesn't have to come to us, but at least if we share that, that has also helped us a lot. For example, how COVID will apply in the context of Indian law situation versus the US or Singapore or UK or whatever it is across border elements, industry specific in the pharma industry, in the technology industry, software industry, software product industry. So we have tried to do those things. And at the end of the day, as I mentioned, that we share with public. So we also get to know that as just as we are getting a lot of questions from when people ask us questions, we also learn. So it's not one way traffic. So COVID situation, that's how we have been handling. Thank you. Thank you, Nishit. Uh, there are a number of questions from students, not just in India, but also from the US and UK. Uh, there's somebody from uh, Satyam Anaja, uh, Santosha, Pranjal Poder, uh, Pranav, uh, Yash Mehta. Questions both for Chris and Nandan that how your firms are dealing right now with regard to internships and placements. Uh, a lot of uh, you know news is coming in the grapevine about in relation to uh, offers that have been given are being potentially deferred. Uh, internships are being converted into online. Uh, is that a firm-wide policy that's been involved and to what extent do you see this as an impact on uh, students? Nandan. Raj, happy to take that. I, I do think one of the biggest challenges that the law firms uh, are going to deal with is how we are going to continue to train our lawyers. How are we going to continue to mentor um, our trainees and interns? Um, taking specific concrete examples, at least in the U.S., um, summer associate program is um, something that we all do every summer, and that is the pipeline through which we recruit our full-time associates every year. Um, this year, summer is uh, approaching us uh, very quickly. Um, we have made the announcement that we are keeping our summer program although it is going to be abbreviated. We're going to have it for seven weeks, uh, out of which two will be virtual, and we're, ho we're hoping to have five weeks of the seven weeks um, in person, like the way we used to have, if the regulations and the circumstances permit it. Um, but overall, 
I know there are a lot of anxieties among uh, interns and people who have offers from law firms. Uh, a lot of law students are concerned about exactly what is going to happen. You know, our own approach, not only to people within the firm, but also people who are interested in joining the firm eventually, is that we are trying to do the best we can to minimize the adverse effects on our people and the people who are interested in joining us. Uh, the point here is we are all in this together. Um, I do not think we are trying to allocate the pain disproportionately. It's just not the way to do it. As I said before, uh, we are going to be around after the crisis. We need to think about what the decisions we take today are going to do to our business going forward. So I, I do think that to some extent, the circumstances will drive how we behave. And it's hard to tell exactly what tomorrow brings to us, uh, let alone what we're going to face two months from now. But at this point of time, we are doing our best to minimize uh, the adverse effects on, on our people and students and interns who are interested in joining us. Thank you, Nandan, for that. Uh, Chris, the same question to you as well. Yeah, look, I'll be brief, Raj, if I may. I think Nandan put it um, beautifully. Um, look, the, the extraordinary thing is, um, is that the profession of law is remarkably robust. And um, part of, the, part of the, the skill that we try and bring as lawyers is to simplify complication and to reduce noise in a busy world. And there is a lot of noise at the moment. A, a, a crisis brings enormous amounts of noise and it's the job of the lawyers to try and reduce that noise and to make life clearer. And so it's a little bit like, I've, I've been very fortunate in that I've taught a lot at different Indian law schools, including very much at, at your school, Raj. And one of the topics that I teach is cross-border M&A. And I teach a little bit about the um, acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover by Tata Motors from Ford. And of course, when students are first introduced to that, it's a big, complicated, international cross-border deal. They don't even know where to start. So where I start with them is on, please think about buying a motor car. What do you need to do to buy a motor car? You need to check the title. You need to agree a price. You need to have some representations in terms of how many miles it's done. You might um, need some pre-signing pre conditions. You might need some post-signing conditions around delivery. And our job during this crisis is to understand what needs to be done for different clients around the world and to simplify and clarify those messages. So that's a long way of saying exactly the same thing as Nandan, is that I believe that law firms have remarkably resilient um, businesses. Are they making sensible decisions about salary freezes? Are they looking at bonuses? Are they looking at um, uh, recruitment you know, freezes, at least for the time being? They're looking at all of those things because they want to make sure that the firm tomorrow can continue and to provide employment and to provide you know, um, input for clients, et cetera. So exactly as Nandan has says, we are absolutely in the job of um, looking after our current people and the business model of law firms, which I say, is a robust business and is a and nothing about covid changes that if you're a student around the world you should be thinking about law in exactly the same way you were thinking about it before covid um, and we will be recruiting in exactly the same way at internship level at trainee level at vacation scheme level practically how we work through that in the way that nandan's described we, need, we will need to conclude, and that information on that will be on every law firm's website. But please rest assured that the, um, the, the need to attract super clever, bright people from universities from around the world, including from India, will continue just as before. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I want to quickly move to High Green. Uh, High Green, one of the things. Can I make a point here? Can I just share one experience? Yes, 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 please go ahead. Only one minute. You know, just to let you know, about 15 years ago, we started a virtual internship program called Wall Intern, and we have Wall Mentors. And uh, so for a long time, we did it because a lot of people we could not absorb in the firm, but we still wanted to help them to learn things, you know, irrespective of whichever geography they come. So we started that wall intern program, and then we have mentors also, and all that we had to do was to connect with technology, so we don't allow them to use their personal computers, except if it is non-client work, and security systems have to be there. Contractually, confidentiality has to be guaranteed. And number three, that we have developed our own software called Bandwidth Manager, so whenever they have time, even during the college or outside, the software actually tells us that they have a time and we can find some work to. So it is no longer that you have to continuously do internship. You can say, I'm free at this point of time, we come to know, and then we have some dedicated person to just distribute the work and stuff like that. So the, the, that wall intern program, virtual internship program, suddenly has come very handy now as well. So I think that kind of uh, models can be adopted. So, you know, we don't uh, lose out on training the new talent that has to come, whether they work for us or anywhere else, doesn't matter. But our job is to train them and create talent pool in the country and in the world. Thank, so thank you, Nishit. Oh, no problem, Nishit. Uh, so, Hygreeve and Cyril, there is a question coming for both of you. Uh, a very interesting question about, um, uh, there's a student from the National Law School in Jodhpur. Uh, the student is asking that, how would you advise the companies should perceive, let's say, environmental and social and governance issues after pandemic? In the sense that today, what we're seeing is that uh, there are, we are right now facing a particular crisis. But if you ask and talk to climate change scientists, they say that the vulnerability that we're facing on account of that is far greater and far more significant. So, to what extent? Law firms like you, Ketan, you know, Amarchand, Cyril Amarchand, what would be the kind of conversations or, let's say, advice that you will potentially render to companies in that context? High agree first and then Cyril. Uh, so I think very important uh, uh, practice and, you know, uh, lays the emphasis on the governance and risk practice. Uh, so to go to uh, businesses, companies, and really, this is a huge learning uh, that look, where are they on governance? Where are they on risk? Uh, and what are they really doing from a legal perspective, from a business perspective, whether it is insurance, whether it is uh, in relation to disaster management and uh, on a more long term basis, really caring for the environment. Because, look, we may all mitigate risk by uh, sort of our own uh, uh, one particular business, but from a more global perspective, uh, really look at it that look, are we really contributing uh, to the environment? And this has really shown that something so small can become something so large uh, around the world. And I think every bit will count. I think people have realized that every bit in terms of saving the environment will count. Thank you so much, uh, I agree. Sir. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, this is one topic, uh, corporate governance with a specific reference to ESG is something which I'm spending a lot of time on. So while there are a lot of practitioners in the firm who are dealing with uh, a lot of other areas of advice, one area on which I'm particularly focused on is uh, guiding boards uh, and managements in terms of just the corporate governance dimensions. Because a couple of things have happened. I think as far as boards are concerned, uh, the role of their board, the role of the board has now come into the spotlight. The buck stops at the board. It doesn't stop at the promoter. It doesn't stop at the management. It stops at the board. And this is not an ordinary situation. We're finding independent directors becoming particularly active as well, and they are being, they are engaging a lot with management on almost on a daily, if not weekly basis. Also, we are finding that managements are using uh, the independent directors as advisors and they're open to seeing them as a resource rather than as an obstacle. So the whole governance conversation has become front-ended. 
uh, and in india as you know under the indian corporate law which was amended in 2013 we have already moved from a shareholder model of governance to a stakeholder model of governance section 166 just to you show a section but the, the 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 shortfall in that has been that we have not in the past been able to see that as a justiciable or an enforcement uh, enforceable concept and i think india is just one judicial innovation away from actually enforcing uh, enforcing this model of stakeholder governance so that's one thought the second thought which is a kind of a related thought but i want to leave it on the table is a practice of a, a sort of practice of everyday ethics this is a subject which is quite of close to my heart as well and i think there is not enough discussion taking place in terms of bringing ethic building the ethical infrastructure of corporates and the community in terms of how to deal with this if you going to fire 100 employees uh, and if that is what is required for the business so be it i'm not saying that you cannot take a utilitarian approach but there is a way of doing it now you might i think everybody would have seen the uh, the letter from the airbnb uh, ceo a few days back there's a very good example of where he actually made a tough decision but the manner in which it was communicated the kind of trade offs that were made so this is an example really how you bring ethics into the conversation what's happened in the past is esg there has been too much emphasis on e i think the e part hijacked the whole agenda and sng was on the side so what covid has done is sng has now taken equal status as the e element if not more i think particularly particularly the g bit is now leading the pack Thank you, Cyril, for that uh, wonderful set of responses. Um, Nandan, there's a question from uh, Harini Jambunathan. Uh, Harini is asking a very interesting question, which may be in the minds of young people. Uh, she's asking that does this pandemic and subsequent lockdown have any lessons for specialization as a lawyer? What is something young lawyers should keep in mind while thinking about which areas to choose as they think about their future? very good question um, i'm sure uh, most experienced lawyers are having second thoughts about the specialization that they have followed at this point of time um, i personally again believe that the choices that you make should be driven by your personal interest personal passion not again driven by crisis right um, i don't think you know i i'm reminded of the analogy in the pharmaceutical world um a lot of pharmaceutical companies have not invested much in um finding cures for viruses because viruses mutate themselves you find a cure by the time you find a cure for a virus that virus has disappeared and there is already a new virus in my mind specialization is the same same way you cannot wait for a problem to come up and then decide what you are going to specialize in that problem would have disappeared and i i i do think that um again i just want to be helpful i think that's a basic framework in which the law students need to be thinking about it having said that um in every crisis that we've gone through that i referred to early on having dealt with it over the last 25 years um the more things change more they remain the same uh, but every single industry has been affected in almost all of the crises that that have gone through right and there are some core skills that law students need to learn um learning about law of contract learning about corporate law learning about disputes um learning about um the the you know the uh, various other specialized with the restructuring bankruptcy the fundamental skills you need to put them together have a building block and time for deciding on specialization will will come much later in your career and at that point of time you'll have a much better perspective on choosing which is the right area for one thank you nandan that was fantastic and very useful I have, of course, questions now for a few more, and uh, we are. Uh, there are hundreds of questions. I am not uh, picking them up. And uh, Nishit, there is a question from one of our faculty members from Jindal Global Law School, Shireen Moti, and she's asking you, uh, what are some of the measures that the government of India could take 
in order to contain the economic fallout of COVID-19. Uh, very specific uh, sort of public policy type question. Yeah, I think first of all, uh, you know, it should be the strategy of the country that should drive what needs to be done. In my personal view, in the short term, manufacturing will not create jobs. I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. It will take one, one, two years, even though you take supply chain or whatever it is. So I think we need to have little diversion to the manufacturing focus to the services. And all kinds of India has always done well. So I'm not against manufacturing. Don't get me wrong for a moment. But if you want to create immediate employment, services is the area where, number one, you have low cost of in, uh, setting up. Immediate setup, no gestation period. You All that you need is a good computer and good training material and online things that are happening, whether it is shoe polish chain, for example. We have to come up with a number of different ideas. Tourism now is going to take a little backseat because of the travel and stuff like that. But virtual tourism is going to take uh, place, you know. And how do you contain? So we have to really see that what are the new things that we can create employment. Drones I mentioned earlier, I don't know. But it is going to create largest amount of employment because no unmanned drones are permitted. Like delivery boys were the biggest segment where employment happened, did not happen in manufacturing. So I, again, I'm not saying don't focus on manufacturing, but do not ignore the services. India has always excelled on services, whether you take airline or hotel or any other software services or whatever you call it. You know, services, we have done excellent job and we are very complimentary to even China. And we create interdependent world to get more security. So we export services. China may export goods, but both are interdependent. Then we'll, uh, we'll be safer than trying to fight against each other. Anyway, I don't want to go into detail, but this was one of the most important things I would suggest. And regulatory framework should happen ahead of time. As I mentioned, anticipate, prepare, and deliver. If you want to start looking at the regulation, think of designer babies now, not when in five years' time suddenly you got ethical issues and public protest comes up, you know. It was driverless car. Now we have to focus on flying cars. And I've been suggesting don't focus so much on building new roads, but have flying cars. Like we contemplate from uh, uh, landline, we did not go for straight away went for cell uh, cellular phones, right? So we had that kind of thing. We have to think quantum jump and have regularly. I was talking about uh, 5G. Suddenly, when it will come, you will have no time to think. And that is where we need to work with the government. And I, in fact, I just want to add one more point. We even have to completely rethink how we are governing the country itself. So we are having a program also next week, three or four series, how to have a parliament in the cloud with the whole decentralized governance is going to drive. For a temporary period in crisis, you have one man driving to the show. But in six, eight months, we'll have very difficult, so many decisions to make. We'll have a lot more so lawyers and uh, regulators have to come together, but we'll have to create more models for decentralization. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you. the entire form of governance also is something that we lawyers need to sit together and work around. As I mentioned that on 14th of May, we are doing that program, uh, you. Uh, you know, state parliament in the cloud like Amazon. Thank you, Nishit. What an extraordinary conversation we are having when there is total lockdown in the world where moving cars are not able to move we are talking about flying cars as well, and that's indeed about anticipation of the future. And I could have this conversation only with this outstanding bunch of lawyers. Um, Chris, question to you, Rimjim Mishra. Rimjim is asking a question, you know, uh, she's a student who finds a balance between the need to be productive and also to be able to be conscious of our uh, health. In some ways, the real question is, there is a competition out there. There is a competitive world where one has to perform and demonstrate one's best and at the same time one needs to be conscious of one's mental health is there a balance that one can achieve yeah look i clearly believe there is otherwise i wouldn't be banging this particular drum raj um and I, I don't know what it is about lawyers the sadly lawyers seem to outperform in this area of of um of mental ill health. I don't, and I haven't worked out whether it's lawyers, it's the sort of people who are attracted to do law. In other words, we're incredibly diligent and perfectionists and want to get everything right. 
or whether it's uh, on the one side or, or on the other side, whether it's the the environment and the culture and the long hours that, that, that are required of them. Look, I'm absolutely convinced that it is possible both to be an incredibly effective, able, talented, brilliant lawyer who can provide enormous value to clients and not have to work 18 hour days. I've no doubt about that. I mean, you only have to look at the research to understand that if you've been working for 19 hours, you are in the same state as if you were legally drunk. And, you know, whether you'd want your doctor um, uh, operating on you when they were legally drunk or your lawyer giving you advice if they were legally drunk, I don't think you would. So actually, it should be in all of our interest to try and start changing the cultures. And I think there are two ways in which this can happen. One is that leaders like the people sitting around your virtual panelist table um, start talking about this and start creating an environment that is very different from the environment at the moment and or that there are bodies of students that start saying look this is important to me and this will affect my decision as to whether I become a lawyer or a doctor or a civil engineer or an architect or some other profession and I think that if students become more vocal in this area, they too can have uh, an input. And I think that would be helpful. Thank you so much, um, uh, Chris. Cyril, there is a question for you, uh, a difficult one. Vaibhav, uh, Vaibhav Ganjiwad uh, is asking this question. You know, uh, this is regarding, you know, fees from clients. You know, from your experience of tackling the 2008 financial crisis, do you think clients would want to reimagine the entire fee structure for legal services? In some ways, is this a moment of a, a total reimagination of a fee structure and the fee framework that prevails in law firms? Can there even be a consensus among a group of law firms with regard to fees? So that's a great question. And uh, coincidentally, this is the exact conversation I had with a couple of general counsel over the last few days on really looking at the long term kind of intellectual robustness of the hourly rate model. I think the, the uh, all the ills of the, uh, the legal world, including the mental health issues, can be ultimately traced down to the hourly rate. Uh, that is the root of all evil uh, in the profession. So that, and I think that is the model that needs to be reimagined. And there are a number of general counsel who are already starting to think about more about outcomes and about the value that they are getting. They are not. Uh, they 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 are kind of disillusioned with the idea of two partners and six associates showing up at the meeting when they think that one partner and two associates could easily have done the job. And they, they are kind of cynical about the model where they think that because of your economic and your commercial model that you need to, you need to have so much leverage. So uh, I don't know whether the GC community is bold enough yet to experiment with the fact that, okay, there will be value billing or outcome based billing, but the conversation has definitely started. And client by client, I think we will see, uh, see outcomes on that. And which will also, I mean, if, if this picks up force, I think you will see this effectively affecting the shape of the law firms as well with more use of technology, more use of standard processes and using the lawyers only for the brainy stuff. It'll, and it will have cascading effects again also on the kind of training, what kind of skills you get. So this is, a, this is an issue which I think somebody has to bell the cat. Uh, the GCs are mentally ready for this conversation. Uh, maybe one of us on this call has to do it. Well, thank you so much, Cyril, for that. Uh, and as I said, questions are coming in. I'm going to pick up a few. Um, this question is particularly for Hygree, but also others can take it. I agree, um, the, there are a number of questions, and I'm going to paraphrase it. The, what they're asking is that, is the new law firm going to be including other areas of business practice? So, for example, you know, company secretaryship, issues surrounding accounting, 
uh, to what extent consultancy practice. So in some ways, the sanctity and integrity of the law firm practice, as we all understand, is this a moment for us to reconsider when in the real world, there is a lot of convergence and interdisciplinary engagement happening? Uh, great, great question, uh, you know, Raj. I think that, look, in this new world, it's about collaboration. Uh, now, in that collaboration, whether all of these practices, let's say, sit under one roof or one is able to collaborate uh, between uh, practices and firms, providing all of this and having a very close network. Uh, to be able to render that one service uh, to the client. Now, I think it will happen in terms of two ways. One, sector knowledge. And I think lawyers having that technical and sector knowledge, whether it is around digital, whether it's around cyber, whether it's around uh, healthcare and pharma, uh, will be very, very important. To that extent, I think the non-lawyer technical help will definitely be required. On the other hand, I think in terms of finance, whether in terms of accounting, whether in terms of engineering, uh, all of that definitely will be required, but there can be two models, a close collaborative model or a one roof model. And I know there are regulatory challenges uh, in the one roof model, uh, but uh, yes, definitely that's the future of the practice, uh, collaboration. Yeah, please, Sarul. Yeah, I wanted to get that question to you as well, please. Yeah, I kind of agree with Haigri uh, when I think it's going the other direction. I don't see the outcome of this as law firm leaders and uh, thinking about really trying to have all these uh, services under one roof. It's very inefficient apart from the regulatory challenges. In fact, I think firms may become narrower and deeper into what they know best and supplement it with collaborations. Why should I be building a company secretarial capacity uh, in my office? Or why should I be thinking of bringing accounting services uh, into my firm? I would much rather collaborate with somebody who is best in class uh, and doing that. So I think one of the things that will change in the mindset of, uh, of law firms, and I think in all businesses, is a mindset of collaboration rather than ownership. You don't need to own all these businesses you can actually collaborate and create kind of a virtual framework. Thank and, you so and you much. Should stick, and you should stick to what you know best. Thank you so much. That's a very good piece of advice to students as well. Um, uh, there are questions from Ashwin Tiwari and Aditi Vasani and uh, uh, Dipay and Chaudhary. Maybe Nandan, you can take a bit of that. To what extent uh, the use of dispute resolution mechanisms will get, let's say, uh, I will receive stronger attention as opposed to regular commercial uh, litigation. In some ways, is the nature of commercial litigation practice going to change? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to take that question uh, to our Indian friends as well. Uh, but for where you are sitting, is that something which might potentially happen? The short answer is probably yes. Um, you know, the trend towards alternative dispute resolution had already begun long before this crisis uh, came about, right? Um, I think there are different challenges for uh, corporate disputes and for individual disputes, right? I think the, the, the regular, the judicial system is set up to meet the needs of a large section of uh, users. Uh, individuals, small corporations, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and big businesses. I think it will be very hard for the uh, the traditional judicial system to radically transform itself and cater to the needs of the litigants uh, entirely through virtual means. I think there are a lot of balancing, a lot of uh, competing considerations that need to be uh, balanced here. Uh, not everybody has internet connection. Um, there are a lot of issues about security, uh, issues about costs. So I think the judicial system is going to struggle for that. But I think in the world of corporate disputes, the trend towards alternate dispute resolutions, and given these limitations of the traditional judicial system, 
um, the trend towards alternate dispute resolution is is only going to be getting much stronger. I think it is much more flexible, much more nimble. Corporations can make up their own rules. Uh, so arbitration, uh, the, the the parties to contract write their own rules. And so they can decide, even in the middle of a dispute, that they're going to conduct the proceedings uh, virtually. So I think the current crisis is going to make people much more conscious about the need to be flexible. And I think the alternate dispute resolution me mechanisms are going to lend themselves uh, to those situations and they are going to come out on the winning side at the end of this process. Thank you very much, Nandan. Uh, there are several questions about opening up of uh, you know foreign law firms and all of that. I'm going to ask quickly Nishit and uh, you know Chris to weigh in on that. Is this whole uh, situation with regard to you know opening up of the Indian legal industry to foreign law firms? Uh, can we? Is it safe to assume that um, that's going to be uh, in the uh, not a priority from the standpoint of any legal and regulatory attention? Nishit and then Chris. I think first thing is that, uh, you know, physical offices are losing their relevance, number one. It only question is whether you are licensed to advise on Indian law or not. So physical office, whether you're sitting in India or Singapore or anywhere else, you are still able to do it. And I'm sure you are practicing Indian law in some way or the other at times. I'm not talking about everybody here, but people have done it. And, you know, it becomes uh, like, you know, uh, uh, what was uh, coming up was like surrogate practice. That is what some people had indulged into, right? That's what created resistance. Now, from the beginning, I feel that everything has to be global, no doubt about it. And I believe SIS, uh, SILF, the association has already been seized up there and there is some program already being talked about how to open up and if at all to be opened up and stuff like that. So I would not comment too much on that. But at the end of the day, services are the easiest one to grow global. Okay, you can have one office and serve the whole world. Doesn't make a difference. But how do you do that? And those are the kind of things we like to see. And uh, you know, in principle, I think we would like to have it open. Why not? Absolutely. But Thank how to do Thank it you. is something that we needs to work on. We one needs to work on. Thank you, Nishit. Chris. Uh, Raj, I'm just going to just get my crystal ball and <laughs> it's, it's not working. <laughs> right. Uh, I can understand that. That, that explains. Uh, Cyril, please. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, sort of I, I agree with uh, what uh, Nishit Bhai says, but I think, you know, at a, at a very high level, you know, the world of law firms, global law firms is divided into kind of two camps, the global firms and the independent law firms who basically practice home country law. I think at this moment, because of uh, because of COVID, and again, it could change. I think it's advantage independent firms. Well, I think the balance has uh, moved towards independent law firms. The, the global model, with some exceptions, uh, is more under challenge than the independent model because of global cost, different markets kind of reacting differently. So at this stage, I think the wind has moved uh, in, a, in, in the other direction, which is not to say that the, the global models which are represented on this panel or many similar to them uh, are sort of, uh, you know, going to be challenged in a fundamental way. They're very smart and very uh, able, uh, ably led, uh, led firms. But it has, I think the the emphasis in terms of how independent law firms will do in their home country markets that has significantly gone up as a result of this because the underlying principle is i think we are in a moment of deglobalization on steroids uh, with travel being so we look at even in terms of how we will do international keep international relationships now i'm able to have this very free conversation because i know both chris and nandan for over two decades can you imagine if we were having this conversation, if I was meeting them for the first time on this call? So I think there's going to be a very big difference in terms of how relationships are built and how international business uh, will be done. And unfortunately, since we are in a, a phase of deglobalization, I think all bets are off. 
friends, we are coming to slowly to the end of the program. I know that I have got another 150 questions, which I will not be able to ask you. We could go on forever. Uh, there is a question that is addressed to many of you in the panel that, um, you know, one of the things that governments are facing today, definitely in India, but I, I would like uh, our friends from New York and London to weigh in is that policies get formulated, laws get passed, and there is so little consultation that takes place, particularly on economic legislation. And even if such consultation happens, it happens even much lesser with lawyers and people who are in law firms who ultimately end up dealing with these disputes. Do you think that there is going to be any change in that scenario? Because since you are all leaders of law firms, Cyril and Nishit and uh, High Grieve, do you think that this is a moment for us to you know, emphasize that we need to have better consultation even before the policy making processes so that we can avoid embarrassment and even potentially huge economic and financial lost opportunities for India as a country. And I will like the same question to be reflected by both uh, all, all the panelists, uh, starting with uh, Cyril and then we could go through the whole uh, group. I think that probably overstates it a bit because my experience, at least on the uh, Indian side, is uh, the government and regulators like SEBI or RBI, uh, they are taking inputs. It's not as if they are not. Can they do more? Of course they can. And uh, they are having to make decisions just now under great pressure. Uh, they have to act with speed. They don't have the time to you know, hold uh, uh, webinars or physical meetings and consult all of us wherever possible they are. So I think they can certainly do more, but I think it's an overstatement that they're not consulting uh, the private sector uh, professionals as well. It goes back to also a point I made in my opening remarks that the role of the state has kind of magnified itself like a hundred times. Uh, and therefore it casts a greater responsibility on the state to do things wisely and with appropriate uh, consultations. And to some extent, I think the media is playing a role. I think uh the media is having these conversations and i think that the government is looking at the media in terms of the inputs that they're getting some of them are of course biased but there is some good stuff uh there as well so i'm open to how the other panelists feel but i don't feel as pessimistic as your question would suggest thank you sir thank you so much uh, yeah i think uh, what Sil said is right there's a huge amount of consultation going on between lawyers and the government and stuff like that the question is who is the real decision maker okay and often that gets wild down about down to the bureaucratic issue and at the end of the day ministerial issues as well so problem is that it is not consultation but how do you conclude and implement that is where we are lacking behind i think something needs to be done for not only decision making but quick implementation and next one small thing that we really, really we need to learn is uh, drafting of the regulations which is causing a lot of problems, you know? So I think that small thing would change a lot because you are not clear in your writing, how can citizens and the companies behave? And that's why I think we need to help them to do that, but they are doing internally and then they come up and when they come up, they don't have enough consultation, especially in case of tax, which has become the biggest problem. Uh, there is no consultation. In 21 days time, whole budget is passed and nobody even not a word of consultation. And this is the biggest uh, thing that is bogging down many of these uh, <laughs> situations. I think so. Consultation is not a problem. And as I mentioned, that we have to now think, anticipate, prepare, and deliver. <laughs> Prioritize the issue because you can't handle all the issues at one go. And move, move forward. One can go on for the whole evening and tonight, but I think I should stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can I have a high grief? Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, I mean, one of the things which both of them are saying is that there is consultation happening. Uh, the question is to what extent uh, that consultation or those views and perspectives get shaped into actual law and policy. Uh, what's your uh, perspective on it? I agree. I think I think uh, my perspective is that it's very positive. And if you look at the past and where we are today, we have come a long way that consultation is happening the inputs are being taken and i'd say that it is also enthused quality practitioners in actually giving the time 
I can tell you a decade ago, would quality practitioners really want to give the time because they feel that what they give and their inputs are never going to be taken into account. Today, I think it's a completely changed environment and that is really, really positive. Really, really positive. Can we do more? We can always do more. Because Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Nandan and Chris. Yeah. Um, Raj, I think the, um, I mean, I think consultation is happening. I think the current uh, technological uh, platforms that are available are actually making that easier. I don't think that the consultation is happening necessarily in a formal sense, but the leaders and the policymakers are having to contend with the views of the people that are being expressed in a lot of different forums, right? So as soon as a decision is being made, even though there may be no established formal structure for communicating one's views, the digital world is filled with the responses from the people, the comment of the people. And, you know, I do not think the policymakers and the government leaders are completely blind or just deaf to the commentary that's being provided in the in the uh, wider media. But having said that, I, I do think there has to be much better formal structure for soliciting inputs and consultation from all different perspectives. Um, I do wonder though how practical it is in all circumstances. For example, the the in the United States, uh, we passed a legislation providing close to $3 trillion of um, stimulus in response to the crisis that we were facing. And that legislation was enacted in a matter of days um, or at most a couple of weeks. I don't think there was a lot of consultation there, but something needed to be done immediately. Uh, not everything that was in the legislation was, um, was the right outcome, but something needed to be done. So in those circumstances, I do think people need to balance the need to act quickly, while at the same time um, it needs to be um, it needs to take into account perspectives from a, a, a large section of the population. Uh, Chris, thanks, Raj. Thanks. Um, look, um, I, I think as successful lawyers, we all have opinions on all kinds of things. <laughs> and that's the nature, I think, of, of being a lawyer, that we, we have a view on things. And sometimes I, I worry that we sometimes um, think that we have an overstated role in society. And I'm being particularly critical of myself here. And the, the reality is, is that the practice of law is, for the most part, a symbiotic relationship with what our clients are doing. And we're trying to help our clients navigate um, the landscape, the legal landscape and the regulatory landscape at any particular time. And of course, the landscape at the moment is particularly complicated. And our role is to try and simplify and, pr and provide clarity in relation to that. Are there opportunities when from time to time certain senior members of our profession can feed into government on certain things? Yes, there are. And I can think of ways in which Cyril and Nishit and Highgreave and Nandan have talked about um, bodies where senior lawyers sit on. That's not most of what we do. And so I, I just temper our ability to influence what's happening day to day. And quite rightly, at the moment, public policy should be very focused on um, medical advice and the medical profession. And one of the things that's really struck me I guess, more than anything uh, recently. And my eldest son is a doctor and my youngest son is training to be a doctor. And I reflect on how much my eldest son, who's on the front line at St. Thomas's where Boris Johnson was being held, is paid. And I compare that with what young lawyers are paid. And I just wonder whether there's a very interesting discussion to be had around equality, uh, which, which Cyril sort of hinted at right at the beginning. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, we just have going to take a couple of questions uh, and we'll wind up that. Uh, Cyril, there is a question. Uh, in fact, there are many lawyers from Cyril Amachand and Nishit Desai uh, have asked questions. 
uh, you know, one of the questions is surrounding issues related to privacy. And I'm I'm not going to ask the question that they've asked, but I'm going to ask the question which is in the minds of many people today. This uh, new app which the government of India has introduced, the Aroke Setu app, which is pretty much there is a there is a thinking that this app should be made mandatory for people to use. So now without knowing without commenting on the technical and issues surrounding privacy of the app itself to what extent issues related to privacy are as important in other times as it is during covid 19. Uh, Sir. yeah so i think this comes yeah. back to yeah. one of my general comments on that public good and the state has become more important than the individual so in where there are these competing interests in this time of crisis who wins so uh, i think it's pretty clear in the current setup it is the state or it is the broader public good that wins uh, and therefore the the interest i mean while there is a very legitimate uh, set of thinking and arguments in relation to privacy it will probably have to subordinate itself i don't know whether you are aware but chris might be that uh, there is a similar app in australia as well where yes. everybody has and and the six law firm leaders folks like myself who lead uh, law firms who came out publicly uh, and wrote an article in the media uh, supporting the app and saying that this is something which is required and that lawyers should not be allowed to hijack the privacy agenda this is what the country needs and we fully support it and a lot of top leaders from the australian mar uh, market exactly you know the the, the top uh, cream of creme de la creme of the Australian law firm world publicly came out and supported it. And whilst in ordinary times they would have made an argument for for privacy, at this moment the requirements are different. Thank so you, I, will, I, will, Thank I, will, I will I will I will I will kind of subordinate our privacy uh, needs now and think of the broader public good for the moment. After this crisis passes, maybe we can have a different view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nishit. Yeah, I think I have slightly different perspective that should we compromise long term for short term? Okay, because when there is a crisis, when there is a, you know, other kind of thing, we tend to take quick decisions, but forget that we have long term implication. I wrote an article on what is called autonomous weapons some time ago, and I say that if my privacy is compromised and if I get a wrong government, or autocratic government or totalitarian government, they can abuse and, and have a surgical strike on an individual. I can write name, okay? Here's Raj, here is Cyril, here is Nishit, and the bullet will go and hit that particular person because my privacy is compromised. And therefore, I will be extremely careful in compromising and subordinating. I'm, there's beyond state sovereignty, there's something of personal sovereignty. I would rate personal sovereignty higher than the state. It's only the collective good. To what extent you do, one has to be very careful. And I, I do not want to overstate, but I'm very passionate about the privacy issue and very concerned about the way in which the world is moving. And we have to find some balance in some way that this COVID crisis or other crisis will continuously come. And some crises are created and some crises are natural. I think I'm just saying that we need to be careful. I'm not saying we are sorry, uh, well, I, I, No, 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 I, no, 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 I, I appreciate no, that. I just I'm want to add this. one. One minute, Cyril. I am very happy about this because for the last two hours, I am trying hard to find two of you disagree with each other. But at <laughs> last, I'm so close to getting it. So I'm happy about it. Cyril. Go ahead. <laughs> That's very naughty of you. Uh, if you had told us in the beginning, we could have faked a few arguments as well. Yeah, uh, but I know they want to make monkey and two cats. Nah, you know, monkey and two cats. So the two cats fight and monkey benefits. <laughs> no, I, I, I just want to add one more kind of input, which is which will actually build on what Nishit Bhai says. So in my heart, I'm in the same camp as Nishit Bhai. Is that what is going to happen to this data afterwards? See, at the moment, this data and this app is useful for if you know there's some there's a COVID positive person in two meters of you, it gives you a ping. But this data is being captured. And I think unless there is legislation to ensure that at some point when the data becomes redundant, that it is destroyed. I mean, this is also borrowing from the GDPR principles as well, where you've got to destroy data once after a particular period of time. So that's what we need. 
and that's where i think the legal community can step up and and make this argument but personally in the short run uh, i'm not too fussed about it thank you sir lots of uh, lawyers and law professors have raised this issue and i'm going to take it to high grieve and then to the uh, and to chris and nandan is that you see one of the problem in this issue regarding privacy is also relating to the trust that the citizens have with their governments so this the heart of trust is actually playing out to what extent you can impose what kind of measures that will intrude into individual privacy with a view to protecting certain you know important objectives so from that standpoint if you look at it um hygri would you uh, would you be able to reflect are we moving in the direction that because probably at some levels there is if there is greater trust you end up having more intrusions into our rights and freedoms albeit with checks and balances and for a limited duration of time yes sir raj i think completely uh, it is a question of trust and if uh, how does one build the trust so trust can be built in two ways uh, one is of course in terms of past actions and what has been done in the past notwithstanding the rules and the laws and uh, some examples of look what has been done in the past uh, to build the trust more importantly in these times i think trust can be built through communication and if for example with this app there is clear communication that look what is the data that is being collected where is it being stored what can it be used for and how will that data security be ensured and i think the trust factor will completely change it needs that simple communication and i think that will change it so i think uh, that monkey in the room with the two cats can be found then with the two arguing senior lawyers <laughs> thank you hagri uh, nandan i don't even want to ask you about the trust of your president and the people but without talking about that what could you reflect on the issue of privacy within the us context because as you know uh, us uh, civil liberties are a much stronger issue uh, at various levels and the government's intrusion even with regard to let's say imposing lockdown or for that matter you know uh, whatever that we're seeing in many states where there is actually protest coming forward where people are you know uh, conscious of their own ab ability to assert their civil liberties how does that play around within the us context yeah no very good question this is one of the hardest questions and uh, it has put a particular focus on how we strike the balance between personal liberties and a uh, collective good here um i think in the us context uh, this is one of the biggest challenges um i personally i'm on the side of respecting personal liberties um especially you know look i'm not going to uh, take the bait about talking about the trust in the leaders uh, in the united states but i i really think this question about trust personal liberties is really a function of the leaders that you are dealing with right unfortunately uh, this has exposed some of the weaknesses of uh, democracies but uh, people get the leaders that they deserve and elect ultimately right and and the people have to trust the people they elect uh, it's the question of degree of trust that they place in those leaders now in the context of privacy look to me i am one thing that i am convinced about is making decisions in the middle of a crisis about how to strike the balance between privacy and collective good is not the right time to be making those decisions because i think it is going to come out um against personal liberties and the pendulum is going to swing too far away from personal liberties if you make decisions in the middle of this crisis and i think we are going to regret it and i think that is actually ultimately going to affect the trust in the systems in the decision making uh, processes so and just take the example of the decision that the united states government made after 911 and the 
the, the so-called crisis of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And the entire country placed the trust in the government, actually, and thought that what they were saying was actually what was happening. And it turned out at the end of the day, and people have admitted it, that was wrong. And so I'm really concerned about making this decision about privacy and trusting people in, the, in, in this moment of crisis to sacrifice your personal liberties um, is, is probably not going to come out the right way. Um, so I think we just need to be mindful of putting in a lot of thought into making this decision and taking our time and ultimately coming out in a way that we strike the balance appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Nandan. Chris, to you, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Raj. Um, look, clearly, um, you've heard from others how difficult this question is. I'm not going to talk about the detail. I will just talk about the principle, if I may. The, the I, I gave a presentation at the end of January at our client academy in Mumbai on on the question of happiness. And I read a lot of research at that time around what was important to people uh, in that context. And there's a very interesting piece around how we trust each other and how we trust the government to look after us and things. And I think others have pretty much said this, which is that in societies where there is much higher levels of trust, we are willing to hand over more control over our day-to-day -day lives in return for something we hope will, will, will be better than, than not handing over that ability to, to find out more about ourselves. I'm very struck by the fact that in um, 2012, the United Nations started producing data and then producing an annual league table around happiness and that took into account GDP, um, uh, GDP per capita, access to education, ac access to healthcare, uh, freedom of the press and all the rest of it and uh, it's extraordinary the strength of the um, countries that come out very powerfully on that table and if you and and the and the the people that tend to head that table are, are Scandinavian countries, and in Scandinavian countries there is both a high level of trust both in government and in other people. And I was very very struck by one particular bit of data that sort of lodged in my brain for some reason. But if you were to ask somebody from Norway whether they trusted their government and other people, apparently 64% of them would say yes. They happen to score very, very highly on this table of happy societies. Whereas you contrast it with, and I'm intentionally using a country that isn't represented on this, but Brazil, where just 5% of the population said that they trusted their government and they trusted other people. So trust is a very, very vital factor in deciding what we're willing to allow governments to do. Thank you so much, uh, Cyril. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Chris. All right, we are coming to the last question, and that's more like a closing comments. Uh, I would like each one of you to very briefly reflect um, about what is your message to the students who are watching this program. There are thousands of people across, and this will be, of course, uh, is being recorded, and people will be watching it. Lots of anxiety among young people across India and around the world, despite all the level of positivity and optimism that all of us have spoken and reflected in this program, there is tremendous anxiety that young people are facing today. They are also looking at their implications in relation to future careers in law, and even those who are thinking about law as a career may also consider whether that's the best decision they need to make. I request as leaders, and change agents, I would like each one of you to briefly reflect what is your message for the young people of India and the world. Cyril. So my message uh, to, the, uh, to the young students and those who are going to uh, make a career in the law is to remain positive, use this moment of, uh, of crisis uh, as an opportunity to further reinvent yourself, 
I don't think that the need for access to justice is going away anywhere. So long as there are human beings, there will be injustice. And then so long as there is injustice, there will need to be access to justice. And that is the fundamental uh, principle about, about law. Why does our legal profession exist? It is about justice. I think there will be uh, there will be need for corporate law. I think there will be need for a variety of practices as well. So I would I, I think it's a great decision, in fact, more than ever before to be a lawyer. Uh, and it is also equally important that other profession, for example, the importance of the medical profession has also uh, sort of increased enormously. But law is not going anywhere. And I think uh, those who have within them the DNA to be uh, a thoughtful, analytical thinker and the emotional intelligence to be a lawyer, just stick with it and uh, you will be fine. Thank you so much, Cyril. Hi, Green, to you. Uh, my message uh, to the students would be that this is the time to bring out your best. Uh, the profession is about intellect. It's about hard work. And now it's also about, uh, you know, uh, collaboration and efficiency. Uh, so stay safe, stay healthy, look after the others. But uh, look at your development, not just in terms of intellect and the legal capability, but also look at some other capability together. So whether it is technology, whether it is science, uh, and, and look at that as well. So I think that's bring out the best. That's the time. Thank you, Haigri. Uh, Nandan. Yeah, thank you, Raj. Um, I do echo the message that uh, both uh, Cyril and Haigrave have uh, uh, deliver, which is, I think, students need to remain positive, first and foremost. I think law students in particular need to realize that, and lawyers need to realize, we are a privileged group. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world who are going through a lot of suffering, and the current situation has exposed uh, how some people are so privileged and some people are not so privileged. And also think about the healthcare workers in the front line and think about the lives that we lead as lawyers. Um, I think there is a role that all of us can play. Uh, it's not all about making money. Uh, it's not all about just uh, practicing um, corporate law or being at the top of your game. Um, I think what really matters is for all of us to take this moment and consider what it really means to be successful, what it really means to be playing at the top of your game. It's not a bit about making the, the most amount of money. It's not about being at the largest law firm. It's not about getting the biggest titles, right? Um, there will be more crisis. And I think we all need to be strong personally, individually, and find things to do that are going to bring us uh, satisfaction in the long run, not in the moment. And stay focused on the path you choose and make adjustments if the circumstances require you to do that. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Nandan. Yes, uh, I think, uh, Nandan, you say it very well. My first advice to the law students, Take it that you are coming to a profession of law and not business of law. Do not emulate MBAs and investment bankers. We are not in the business. MBA is not a business. You know, our business issue, entire issue is devoted to a question whether it's business or a profession. And we know how business review say it in Nehoria, it is not a profession because there is no binding code of conduct. So first thing, make it clear to yourself they are coming to the profession to serve the people not to just make money and to be happy serving the people the happiness quotient is a second part of the whole game and third thing remember that legal profession was considered to be nobler than noble which was the medical profession in 1900s you know and today it is reversed in many ways i think excessive commercialization of the legal profession is bringing its own ill effects including and mental health and other kind of stuff. The moment you enjoy what you're serving others and putting interest of others in front of you I, without compromising your, your independence, I think that is what will make you happy. 
it's a great profession and it has so many dimensions that you can pick up one small dimension and you'll be prosperous there is no doubt about it but do not come to make money just make money it will it's a by it's a byproduct or a consequence not the starting point i think that is how if you have to think you come otherwise please don't enter the profession you will do more harm to the profession than the uh, benefit thank you so much nishit uh, uh, chris you have the last word uh, thank you raj feel slightly nervous about that um just two two observations i think um if if there are people listening as i know there will be that are anxious worried concerned please please understand that you're not on your own uh, and there are others of us including me who are worried at this time that's completely natural please understand that and um, and know that there are other people out there you're not on your own so that was the first thing i wanted to say i just wanted to comment one one thing in relation to you know the noise and lack of certainty um i just want to encourage all the students to focus on the things that they can control and not on the things they can't control uh, so you know we we can't sitting here today, decide when lockdown ends. We can't decide what it might look like. We can't decide or help with the speed with which a vaccine, which we all hope and pray will be found, um, will, will emerge. But what we can do is that we can focus on our studies. We can focus on each other. We can reach out to a, a relative that doesn't know how to use Zoom and tell them how to use it so you can be in touch with them. And I'll finish, if I may, very briefly, Raj. I mentioned at the outset that of my many bits of brokenness in my life, one of which is alcoholism, and I'm a very happy member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, um, uh, and that has helped me in my recovery. And one of the things that we say at every single Alcoholics Anonymous meeting is uh, something called the serenity prayer. And, I, and I'll share it with you, if I may. So it's God grant us the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for that uh, wonderful set of uh, reflections. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you. What an extraordinary panel. Uh, thank you, Cyril, Nishit, Chris, Nandan, and Highgreave, uh, for your time, for your inspiration, uh, for all the viewers. All I can say is that this group of five people are the tallest and the most outstanding, inspiring law firm leaders, uh, corporate legal professionals. Beyond that, wonderful human beings. The fact that they gave two hours for reflecting on some of the most important issues that we are facing today in the legal profession speaks volumes about their commitment, dedication, and the fact that they care about these issues so much. So I want to express my sincere appreciation, heartfelt gratitude to all of them. I would like to thank on behalf of Jindal Global Law School and OP Jindal Global University for being part of this program. Most importantly, to engage in a two hour conversation, which is part of non billable hours. Uh, that's quite <laughs> extraordinary in itself for any lawyers, uh, including law firms. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, we also want to thank all the viewers uh, for all the questions and the comments that they have given. We much appreciate it. This is part of a public interest series that Jindal Global Law School and OPG Global University is producing. We will meet again on uh, Wednesday, 13th May, at a public interest lawyers colloquium on the theme protecting civil liberties during emergencies. Does COVID-19 pose new threats to rights and freedoms? We have a panel comprising of Ms. Pinky Anand, uh, additional solicitor of India, Mr. Mohammed Khan. Uh, the Delhi government's lawyer counsel, Professor Stephen Marks from Harvard University, uh, Mr. Rahul Mehra, uh, another lawyer from uh, Delhi, uh, Ms. Gita Lutra, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. I also want to apologize to the viewers that quite exceptionally, this is the first time in recent uh, efforts of our university, we've had an all men panel. Uh, we take enormous effort to ensure different forms of diversity that are brought into our discussions. But I do recognize the fact that this particular panel was quite unique and we wanted these individuals to be part of the discussion. I'm grateful to them for their time.
with those words i want to once again thank you and it's such a pleasure to be with all of you thank you raj it is a great pleasure thank you thank you thank you so thank much. you raj great job thank you